today by telling you a story. I want to tell you about a man named Joseph Scriven. Joseph Scriven lived in the 1800s and uh, he lived in Ireland. And he fell in love with his childhood sweetheart. And they dated for a little while, courted, and then they were going to be married. And the day before they were going to get married, they were uh, riding on horseback to meet one another. And uh, just before she arrived, before he did, just uh, as she got there, her horse and threw her off and she hit her head on a rock and she rolled into the river and so when he arrived he found his fiance um, in the middle of the river they you know, sad story well Joseph was so distraught and just overwhelmed he, he couldn't function. He couldn't uh, stand being in the area here where he saw her everywhere. And, he didn't know. and so he leaves Ireland and he goes to Canada. And so he gets in Canada and he begins trying to put the pieces of his life together again. And uh, someone introduced him to Jesus. And he accepted Jesus as his Savior, surrendered his life to him, and, and uh, began to serve the Lord. He was committed to the teachings that Jesus had given. And he became a handyman. But the only difference is, he was a handyman that he would only work for those people that couldn't pay him. If they could pay him, he wouldn't do the work. So he only worked for people that couldn't pay him. And so, as time went on, there was a young lady who noticed this really godly man. She was attracted to him. Sure enough, they fell in love. And they were planning their wedding in just a few weeks prior to the wedding. She called, she was 23 years old. She called pneumonia and died. Who loves? Who loves? Well, he never fell in love again. He continued to follow God. And so, later in life, his mother got sick in Ireland and was dying, but because he had taken a vow of poverty and would only work for people who couldn't pay him, he had no means to go back to Ireland. And so, he wrote his mother a poem. And the poem became uh, pretty well known. It did, you know, as, as it passes by mouth, things passed around. And uh, so years went by, and uh, he had a friend in his little shanty of a house who saw the original note of this now hymn and found the words to it. And he said to Joseph, did you write this poem? And the poem that he wrote to his dying mother is now the hymn that we've sang for over 200 years. He wrote these words. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege we have to care. Everything of God. He goes on and says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Uh, oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. He says, Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? <coughs> Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord. And that's the story behind that great old hymn. You now my prayer for this message this morning 
is that we will develop a sincere love for the very presence of God through prayer. And I'm afraid that far too many Christians and non-Christians don't really understand what prayer is. And I want to give you quickly three misconceptions about prayer. The first one, and they're coming up, we'll just take them as we get to them, and I've got some comments about it, is that prayer is complicated. A lot of people have the idea that prayer is something that's complicated. They think, uh, some think that you've got to pray in King James English. O God, of thou which art in heaven, bend thine ear to hear our prayer this day and, and use that old English that is not easily understood by us today. And they see prayer as something that's complicated and you've got to do it in the right words, in the right way. Some people think that prayer is uh, kind of a legalistic formula. When you become a Christian, you'll begin to hear things like this. Somebody will tell you, you've got to call on God early in the morning. And, and that's true, but it's incomplete in itself. Uh, then you'll hear somebody pray, say that, well, you should pray an hour. That's intimidating. Right? Do you have like this that that seems kind of intimidating to you? Then, then somehow tell you, they, they've read it in the scripture, that you've got to pray in your prayer closet. And you put all that together and you say, okay, I've got to pray early in the morning for an hour in my prayer closet. And then somehow I'll say, well, you've got to bind up the devil. really sure what that means to be honest and you get this image of taking cords and wrapping around the double so that he's kind of confined and you've got to do it early in the morning for an hour in your prayer closet and then somebody will say and scripture teaches this that you've got to pray in the spirit For a lot of people, who knows what that means? It means uh, a lot of people used to think that means you got to pray really fast and really loud. It's like if you say it fast and loud, it means more. God can hear you better or something. And, and so you kind of get this uh, idea that I can't do it right. I don't know how to do all that. Maybe I'm not holding my hands right. Maybe I should have bound up the devil more. It just seems kind of complicated. And then you, to top it off, you hear somebody pray and you're thinking, boy, God heard that prayer. It's as if God's like really impressed with that prayer and He's not impressed with yours. Like God's thinking, wow, that's a good prayer. thinking, I don't know how to do that. And so a lot of people think that prayer is complicated. The second thing that people think about prayer when you think about prayer is that prayer is boring. Jesus himself one time went to pray and he took some of his disciples and he said, you got to stay right here and pray and I'm going to go over there and pray and and he did that, and when he comes back, what are they doing? They're asleep. That's right. You read that story, or you identify with it one. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, have you ever woke up in the middle of the night and you couldn't sleep? You start praying, and sure, I mean, you're out like that. And if I really want to get back to sleep, I ask Tammy to pray. <laughs> But she prays long prayers. And I sure don't ask her to 
prayer right before I'm getting ready to dig into a meal that I can't wait to get my teeth into. I told her I was going to say that and she gave me permission. But she does pray my prayers. And then, you know, sometimes I'm praying and and I kind of have those ADD moments. Y'all know what I'm talking about? When you start praying, and I, Lord, uh, I prayed for my friend. Oh, I forgot to call Robert back. <laughs> Y'all ever did stuff like that? Yep. Or, or you're praying, Lord, my friend really needs Jesus. Man, I'm hungry. <laughs> it's like your mind is just going ADD. And, and so we have this idea that prayer is complicated and prayer is boring. And then the big one is that my prayers don't work. We feel like our prayers don't work because it's dependent upon us and not the one who's listening to us. Some people feel this way. Well, if my prayers work, why did God heal my Grandmother or somebody we really love and pray for. If my prayers work, why is my marriage struggling? If prayer works, if my prayer works, why don't I have the job that I should have? I don't even have any benefit. And we kind of measure circumstances of life by our prayers and we come to the conclusion that my prayers don't work I need to call somebody else to pray for me. Raise your hand. you ever feel that way? Sure. We do feel that way. So there's a lot of confusion about prayer. And we need to understand that we're not praying to a distant, uninvolved, hard to please God. We're actually praying to a loving and caring personal God who calls us friend like we sang about this morning. Look at John 15 and verse 15. Jesus said this. He, he, he said this talking to His disciples. His disciples. He said, I know I call you slaves because the Master does not confide in His slaves. Now you are my Say it. Friends, since I've told you everything, the Father told me. Do you know that Jesus is not into keeping secrets? He makes His, his will and the Father's will known to us. Did you realize today that God wants to bless you? In fact, turn to your neighbor and look at him and say, God wants to bless you. <laughs> Now, look back at him and say, No, really? He really wants to bless you. But, you know what I found in my years of ministry and in my own life? Sometimes we're not living in the place of blessing. Think about that. Move on, move on. Imagine this that the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the great I Am, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, He calls you friend. And He wants to confide in you. He wants to talk to you. And He wants you to confide did you know that Jesus was even accused by those who were his enemies or called themselves or made themselves his enemies? He said he eats with what? Sinners. As if he wouldn't have anything to do with some people. I heard a great sermon years ago that said this. God's never met a sinner. Maybe that's not. 
And God's never met a sin that He couldn't forgive. He loves you. He's called you His friend. And so we shouldn't think that our prayers are somehow God's not interested in them. That our prayers don't work. And that prayer is boring. It's never boring when you get to talk to an intimate friend. He loves us and gives us access to come before His throne of grace to find help in time of need. He invites us to come to use the King James to come boldly, confidently, because He's not going to reject you. He wants to hear from you. And that's where we're going today. So I got to hurry. Let's look with me at James chapter 5, verse 16. The Bible says, Therefore confess your sins to each other. We won't deal with that part of the verse today. That's another whole other sermon. It says, And pray for each other so that you may be healed. He says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So what does prayer do? Prayer can defeat the devil. It's powerful and effective. Prayer can calm the storms in our life. Prayer can heal the sick. Y'all believe that? I believe that. Prayer can save the man. Prayer can comfort those who are hurting. Prayer can restore those who are broken. Prayer invokes the very power of God. So we're not praying to a distant, uninvolved, uncaring God. We're praying to a close and intimate, all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful God who cares for His children and calls us friends. And so, for well, the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I want to give you four simple truths about prayer. First of all, talk to God like you talk to a friend. I want your prayers to seem to be effective to you. If you want to experience prayer in a sincere way in the presence of Christ, talk to God like you're talking to a friend. Forget what you've heard. Somebody prayed in Sunday school and you thought, man, they know how to pray. That's them. I mean, when I go to Tammy, I don't talk to Tammy like I would talk to some of you. I, I talk to her in an intimate way. Talk to God like a friend. Paul said these words. He said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank Him for what He's done. Now, that's a real simplistic uh, Translation of that verse, so maybe you know it a little bit, but that's really what he said. See, Paul had always dreamed of going to Rome. He wanted to preach the gospel in Rome, but instead, he's in Rome as a prisoner. He's in a dungeon, and he is chained to a guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Zero privacy. You got the picture? Now that's not the way he wanted to go to Rome, but it's the way he got there. And while he's there, he's awaiting his execution. They're going to be happy for preaching the gospel. So what do you think he's doing there? Do you think he's cowering in the corner and giving up because prayer don't work? He's not. 
He's encouraging us. He said, prayer works. Pray about everything. And don't worry about anything. Give thanks to God for what He's done. Tell Him what you need. Here's a simple truth I want, uh, want you to get today. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Let's say it together. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. We need to say it again. Did you get it? If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. So you pray to God just like you're talking to Him and you don't worry about those situations. Because your Heavenly Father knows what you have to do. And when you take your concerns to Him, there's a verse in Psalm that says He will complete what concerns you bring to His perfection. In other words, God's got a perfect will for everything you're concerned about. Right? It may not turn out like you want. But God's going to use the way it turns out for your good and for His glory. You're going to gain something from the experience. And does it have to be early in the morning for an hour in a prayer closet when you're binding up the devil? It doesn't have to be. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Paul said in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, he said, pray without ceasing. You know what that means? All the time. Now <clears throat> well, let me explain how that works. To pray all the time is to have <coughs> uh, regular communication. You know that when Tammy and I are apart, She's texting me. I'm texting her. I'm calling her. How's your morning going? What are you doing this afternoon? Uh, will you pick up some pickles at the grocery store? We're having regular communication. That's what he's talking about. Having regular communication throughout the day. Now hopefully you do have a time early in the morning where you you pray something like, uh, uh, God, I thank you for this day. Lord, direct my steps today. Give me wisdom to make a difference today. God, would you do something that only you can do in my friend's life today? God, would you help me to love this person today that's unlovable? God, will you help me to forgive this person that who's wronged me? God, will you give me the right words to say to encourage somebody who's hurt you today? Hopefully, you can, you can start the day that way. But praying without ceasing is ongoing. When you hear like this, you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Is you have a regular communication. Sometimes I just ask Tanya or call him, hey, I was just thinking about you. I wonder how you were doing I hope you do that with your spouse. As well as you know, you need that. What's, what's going, what do I need to know that I don't know? So let me hurry. First one, just talk to God like you're talking to a friend. Number two, pour out your feelings to God. Pour out your feelings. You know, God gave you your feelings. And you can misuse them. But God wants you to pour out your feelings to Him. I love what Peter says. He says, cast all your cares upon Him. Because He cares about you. God's concerned about what you're concerned about. That, that verse, I, I, I love the literal meaning when it says cast all your cares upon Throw your cares over on the God. Throw. You got that picture? Throw your cares on the God. They're not too much for you. 
not to pay. And do you even realize today that when you are throwing your cares on Him, you are pouring out your feelings, it is not wrong to say, God, I don't understand. God, I don't understand. God, this makes me mad. You ever tell God that? God, this makes me mad. Or even that dreaded question that somehow we've got the idea, God, why did this happen? I don't know where people got the idea that you couldn't ask God why. But you can. The Bible gives us clear teaching that we can cast our cares upon. It doesn't mean that we should disrespect it. But you know what? There are times I just need to vent to Tammy. I just need to get my emotions out. Or she might need to vent to me. What are you yelling at me for? She's not yelling at me. She's venting. You know God is not offended when you just need to say, I want to desire. This makes me so mad. By the way, did you know David, King David, the man after God's own heart? Yeah, I want you to know your head like that if you know that king. That the one I'm talking about. He did this over and over and over in the Psalms. He prayed things like, God, where are you? Why aren't you stopping my enemies? God, why are you letting this happen? This doesn't seem fair, God. Why are the wicked prospering? God, where are you? David, the man after God's own heart, prayed those prayers. I believe you're okay. So pour out your feelings to God. Talk to God like an intimate friend. Number three, Sometimes you need to listen to God. Just listen. Jesus said in John 10, 27, He said, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they do what? You follow me. Listen. It's not all you talking. Prayer is listening as well. Sometimes you just need to stop. Stop. Start. Listen. You know that in the ministry I know people and I see people all the time and have for years who are always uh, saying the same thing but they never listen to what God's trying to say. Because they're too busy talking about it. Maybe they're too busy with their list. There was a song a few years ago with my never-ending shopping list. Maybe you remember that. Billy Graham said this. He said, prayer is simply a two-way conversation between you and God. Have you ever had a friend and you sit down and they talk minutes and then you really had something to say that could help me and they wouldn't stop talking long enough to get their helpful advice, your helpful advice. I wonder if God ever feels that way. <coughs> stop talking! <laughs> we need to be like Samuel in the Old Testament. You know the first prophet? Samuel said, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And God speaks in unlimited ways. So many different ways. You know, if you open your Bible every day, I promise you, God's going to speak to you. It may not be today. You may not get it today. You might not get it tomorrow. But God's going to speak to you because He speaks through His Word. 
Sometimes God's going to speak to you through circumstances. You're going to be so distraught over the circumstances that you've got to listen to what God is saying because you have no idea what to do about it. You're at the end. God will speak to you through people. Sometimes people will say something and it's just like a bell ringing. You know, God is giving you some insight. God will speak to you through a song. We experienced that this morning. I hope, I was thinking as Lisa was doing, I will be done. God speaking to someone. God will speak to you through a song. God can speak to you through His still, quiet voice. It's not necessarily an audible voice, but it's louder than all you know it's God. The question is, when God speaks, how do you respond? God speaks how you respond. And then my fourth point, I finished. Not only do you talk to God like a friend, not only do you pour out your feelings, not only do you listen to God, but always give thanks to God. We're going back to the end of verse four, uh, verse six of Philippians. He says, thank you. For all he's done. You know, at all times, give thanks to God and your life will be happy. The number one attitude that we all need is gratitude. And this is what Paul is saying. He's in a Roman prison cell awaiting execution. He's going to have his head cut off. He said, Give thanks to God. Make your request now with thanksgiving. Because you thank Him for who He is. And that you can trust His plan even if you don't understand. And then look what happens. Verse 7. Then you will experience. I like those then words in the Bible. Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds or surpasses anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The supernatural peace of God. We can't comprehend it. We can't explain it. It's just God's peace in the middle of the storm. Have you ever experienced that? I have. And I'm telling you, friend, there is nothing like to experience God's peace. There is absolutely nothing. Let me give you another truth as we wrap it up. The prayer doesn't Always, I'm not going to be Prayer doesn't always change your circumstances. But it always changes you. Prayer doesn't always change the circumstances. But it always changes you. And if you're still thinking, well, it's not me that needs to change. This needs to change. And this, you're not ready yet. You haven't prayed. You haven't gotten to the end of yourself yet. Sometimes we've got to get to the end of ourselves and realize God's the only help that we need. The songwriter said, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything God has. And then you'll recognize true peace is not found in the absence of problems, but true peace is found in the presence of God.